Hello, and welcome to the Denver Mensa Speaker Series. Today, we are excited to host Terrence Wilcutt, sharing stories and answering questions from his perspective as a retired NASA astronaut. So Terrence, take it away. Thanks, Joy. And thanks for inviting me to uh, talk to you. NASA is a, a busy organization, and I've got lots of slides because we have lots of programs. And like Joy said, if you'll just save your questions, either put them in the chat room or uh, make a note to yourself, I'll be glad to answer them at the end of the presentation. For my career, um, I started out as a, uh, well, I was a math major in, in college. Then I taught high school math for two years. And my dream, I, I enjoyed, I thought teaching was one of the most rewarding jobs anyone could ever have. I really enjoyed it. But my dream since I was a child was to fly airplanes. So I found out that the United States Marine Corps, if you joined under an aviation contract that they would send you to flight school, <clears throat> that was my path to flying. So I joined the Marines, went to flight school, wound up flying fighters uh, all over the world really, and then became a test pilot. My math degree, my STEM degree, uh, qualified me to apply to test pilot school where I was accepted, became a test pilot and tested airplanes um, for the Navy and Marine Corps for four years. At the end of that tour, I was wondering what to do next. And the thing I enjoyed the most besides the flying was working with exceptionally sharp engineers <clears throat> that designed and tested airplanes. <clears throat> the thing that um, would allow me to fly something really spectacular that flew higher and faster than any other airplane and continue to work with brilliant engineers and scientists was to go to NASA's astronaut program. So I put in an application and was fortunate to be accepted. And that's how I wound up coming to NASA. I flew four missions while I was there and I'll talk about those briefly in a few minutes. One of the things I wanted to tell you was that I've met a lot of people around the country that hear about my career and they say, gosh, I always wanted to join the space program, but you know, gosh, my dream forever was to be in the space program, but you know, I thought about this and thought about this, and that would be a dream job, but, and that but was always followed by, I never had the nerve to turn in an application. What I wanna tell you right now is don't say no to your dreams. If you wanna do this job, you have to turn in an application and give us a chance to say yes. Don't say no to yourself. If you're not selected, if you don't get that job, then keep doing what you're doing and make yourself a little more qualified and then apply again a couple of years later. NASA is really good if you don't get selected and you call them and say, why wasn't I selected? They'll say, well, your resume was weak compared to these people and these people. So they tell you how to beef up your resume. If you really wanna do it, apply as many times as possible. The, uh, some of my friends applied four times, seven times, 11 times before they were selected but they all ultimately accomplished their dream job, which was joining the, uh, the space program. So don't say no to yourself and um, make sure you turn in that application and give us a chance to say yes. <clears throat> so let's talk about my career. When I joined NASA, you know, the space program was already in full swing. Uh, the space shuttle was really the most amazing spacecraft ever developed. It, consisted of this external tank, which was not reused, two solid rocket boosters, which are reused every flight, and a spacecraft that launched like a rocket, worked in space as an orbiting laboratory, and then re-entered the atmosphere like a plane, like a glider. The huge payload bay, it uh, carried a robotic arm that you could release and grasp uh, satellites to be deployed or retrieved. You could put large experiments back there, you could carry the modules to construct a space station. No other spacecraft uh, has been able to do that. And currently no spacecraft can do the things the space shuttle was, uh, was doing when it was flying. <clears throat> What's it like to go to space? Well, you've got in the shuttle, you had these three main engines and together they put out about a million and a half pounds of force. The two solid rockets put out about two and a half million pounds a piece. So on the pad, they would light the main engines and they had six seconds for the computers to examine the engines and make sure they were working perfectly. And then they would light the solid rocket boosters. The solid rocket boosters, once they lit, there was no turning back, you were leaving the pad. As soon as they lit, 
and the, the launch restraint bolts let go and the shuttle accelerated, you got about a two and a half G push through the chest. So if you were a man that weighed 200 pounds, as soon as the solids lit and you started accelerating, you felt like you were like you weighed 500 pounds. It was a rough ride under those solid rocket boosters. The ship shook quite a bit. It was hard to reach out. If I was gonna reach out and touch the screen here, my hand would be shaking like this uh, because of the vibrations from the solid rockets. In 30 seconds after they lit, you were already supersonic. The solid rockets burned for two minutes and then they were kicked off the shuttle and the shuttle continued uphill with just the external tank and the, uh, which, and which was fueling the main engines, the three main engines. How long does it take to get to space? It takes about eight and a half minutes from zero to in orbit in about eight and a half minutes. And that's true for almost all uh, spacecraft. The key to getting to space is not to launch and go straight up. The key to getting to space is launching up to clear the tower and get through most of the Earth's atmosphere. Half the atmosphere is below 18,000 feet. The, it's getting through enough of the atmosphere to, to launch up, then you bend over, you, you pitch down, then you accelerate. The key to getting to orbit is reaching orbital velocity, which is about five miles per second. At five miles per second, you've achieved a speed that allows you to orbit the Earth. Um, the space shuttle, once it got to orbit, or just flying it, you can see down here at my cursor at the bottom, these are the forward windows. It's kind of like flying a uh, commercial airliner, the view out the front is similar to what a commercial pilot flies. In this view, you can see the KU band radar, which we use for communication, and the robotic arm extended off to the side over here, of course, which we use to grasp payloads, move astronauts around, or uh, retrieve payloads. The shuttle was designed in the 70s and flew, I think in 1981 was the first flight. So you expect that there's about, this is typical of a cockpit designed in the 70s. Uh, CRT displays, uh, you spoke to the computers by typing in hexadecimal code to uh, change things in the shuttle. Um, no GPS, we had a laptop that was uh, synced up with our um, KU band, which would tell us where, where we were on the world. And then you could look at that and determine if you weren't familiar enough with uh, what the world looked like, then you could use this laptop to tell where you were in the world. <clears throat> Over 2000 switches in the shuttle, um, the commander and the pilot, and this is Bill Reedy, my commander, this is my second flight, of course, myself in the pilot seat. You had to know what every one of those 2000 switches did. And modern airplanes, if you have a switch, if you throw the switch and something bad happens, they put a guard on it or they paint it red, something like that. None of these switches had that human factors weren't considered uh, at the time. So before every mission, uh, the crew members would go through and tape over any switch that could hurt you. So you'd have to think about it before you could throw it. Anyway, that's the, the, the uh, space shuttle. By the way, <coughs> there were five computers that ran the shuttle, four of them talked together and worked together. If they disagreed, then they would um, uh, fail the set. And that fifth computer was an independent computer, different software, it's differently developed, checked differently, it was complete, kept completely different. If the main set failed, you could push a button and it would engage the backup computer so you would still be safe. This is Joe Edwards. <clears throat> <clears throat> one of my pilots. Here's the rest of this is the commander side. You can see you've got an attitude uh, gyro here, a compass, the, the throttles down here. Here's that de hexadecimal keyboard that you used to talk to the ship. All the ECLIS, the oxygen life support switches are on the other side of Joe. And notice what else, whenever you see these pictures, what else is in there? You see Velcro everywhere. Since there's no gravity, if you let go of something, it will flow away. And you don't just look down at the floor to pick it up. It can float anywhere. And so if you drop something, it becomes a real chore to uh, try to locate it. And uh, so everything, there's Velcro everywhere. And whatever you let go of or whatever you don't want to ha handle, you stick it on, on a piece of Velcro and forget it. It's a, you can see in the shuttle, uh, you launch in a spacesuit, in a pressure suit. 
And once you get there, you change into just a normal short sleeve shirt, shorts, socks. You don't wear shoes because you float around. You don't want to kick someone in the face with a pair of shoes. And with no gravity, every day in space is, you know, an opportunity for a bad hair day because um, it doesn't pull it down. It just floats all over. In the mid deck of the shuttle, <coughs> we had a series of lockers. In these lockers, it's an entire, the back wall of the mid deck was completely filled with lockers. The lockers contain our food, our change of clothes, our um, equipment, supplies, everything that your, your crew needs to accomplish the mission, and including some experiments. This is Mike Anderson, and uh, he's using a checklist to run one of the experiments. In, in the shuttle, I wrote a list, of just the, the ones that I could just think of off the top of my head. These are the kind of things that we did in the shuttle. And these are continued onto the space station. The advantage of the space station is that instead of just getting, say, five or six days or maybe 10 days of experiment activity, you can now have it for six months, a year, two years of time to let these experiments take place. Some of the experiments we did are mechanics of granular materials. What is that? Well, it's, it looks at the behavior of soils in earthquake zones and in, in uh, areas where landslides. And they use that information to strengthen engineering codes and building codes, codes in uh, areas that have those problems. Um, protein crystal growth. Almost every disease that humans suffer from is caused by a protein or the lack of one. Well, we grow protein crystals and that's used in something called structure-based drug design here on earth. We have a bioreactor that cultures human cells. We culture cancer cells. And on Earth, if you culture cancer cells, they'll grow, say, in a Petri dish in two dimensions. Well, in space with no gravity, you get uh, cancer cells that grow in three dimensions in our bioreactor, just like they grow in your body. That's used to determine treatments for cancer. Um, almost, if you took the 10 worst diseases that afflict humankind. We do medical research in space, looking for cures or countermeasures to those. We also um, worked on new drugs for osteoporosis. When you get to space, your body realizes right away in zero gravity that it doesn't need a skeletal structure to support your weight anymore. So it starts dumping the calcium out of your bones. For a really long duration space flight or a trip to Mars, that would be a significant problem. You might come back with osteoporosis, even though you're a healthy individual. So we look for countermeasures for osteoporosis. Um, when you age, your muscles start atrophying in space because nothing weighs anything. I could pick up the table that my laptop is on with just my two fingers in space. It, it takes no effort to do anything. Uh, so unless there's you know, uh, designed in resistance, uh, weightlifting, it won't work. So we have, we always worked on exercises and exercise protocol that would keep our muscles from atrophying. Um, balance problems when people return from earth, they many times they have trouble standing. And uh, it's a similar problem that uh, people that are aged have. So we worked on countermeasures to that. That's been successful. We've cultured recently, <clears throat> we cultured heart cells. If you Google, um, cultured heart cells in space, you would find a nice article about it. We cultured heart cells from stem cells, and then a, they applied a little electrical stimulant and the heart cells started beating. The, uh, we hope to bring this back to earth, this technique, and use it to treat diseased hearts, to inject them with stem cells and grow a new section of heart. That research is ongoing. They can do the same thing on earth, but in space, we found that those stem cells propagate more and their survival rate is much higher for the, in the ones we did in space. Um, gosh, there's a lot more, of course, plant growth. Uh, if you're taking a trip to Mars, you can't, it would be ideal if you could grow some food uh, along the way. Plus, of course, plants, they turn CO2 back into oxygen. So that would be beneficial. So we're experimenting with plant growth, how to increase yields which of course is applicable to something we need to do here on earth. And we even have aquariums where we, if you could take some of the protein with you uh, onto Mars and harvest uh, protein from these aquariums, then that would be a good thing. Uh, again, almost anything you can think of, if it's a problem on earth, uh, then we're looking for research to do on, in space and uh, looking for solutions to those problems. And we also do materials research. If you combine 
say steel and ceramics, which would separate here on earth. Well, in space, they don't separate because there's no gravity. So you can get a perfectly combined and a perfectly spherical ball bearing or uh, compartment to an engine. Lots of science research. The reason we go to space, of course, is exploration and, and research. Um, and here's Bonnie Dunbar. In the space shuttle, we got our electricity from fuel cells. We take oxygen and hydrogen, combine it across a membrane, and that produces electricity, which we use to power the station. It also produces heat, which we use to heat, not the station, heat the shuttle, and it produces uh, water, and that's the water we drink. Space station does not use fuel cells. They use solar arrays, just like the Russian space station Mir did. Solar rays don't generate water, so you have to supply the space station with water. Of course, it's, it's quite heavy, um, and it's an incredibly valuable resource. Life can't was, uh, exist without it. So, it's, and by the way, water, I think it weighs about a ton for a cubic yard of water, so you have to preserve it and reuse it. So this, this was an experiment for space station. If you recycle all the water, the humidity that you pull out the air, the urine that you expel from your body and turn that back into drinking water, you have to have equipment that looks for contaminants in the water to make sure that it's pure. That's what this experiment was for, to, to check for the purity of the water before it was put in the uh, section of the water system that would uh, be drank from. Well, after the shuttle was up there, usually a usual mission was say about 12 days. I think we have one that went to 18 days and some of them were as short as four days, four or five days, but the usual mission would be about 12 days. Of course, the shuttle just deorbited, came home, landed like a glider. It's not, there's no engine propulsion here. You had to land, land it just like a glider. It could land <clears throat> in three places. It always launched from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. It can only land at Kennedy Space Center on the runway there at Edwards Air Force Base in California. It could land on the runway or the dry lake bed. And there was a place in New Mexico called White Sands. There's a runway carved out of the gypsum there that you could land on. And again, it landed just like an airplane, except that it, it glided all the way in, no powered. Plus, you had to get it just right every time because you couldn't go around. Okay, so what did I do on my missions? Well, the first mission was Space Radar Lab, and we flew a large radar, a synthetic aperture radar in the payload bay. With this radar, and you could see through the surface of the earth and through plants, you could determine the water content in crops and predict the crop yield from that, which was important at the time because it was, uh, we as a country, I wanted to know every year, I believe, whether the Russian wheat crop was going to fail and there'd be a famine. So we could predict that ahead of time and then adjust what we were going to do based on helping those guys out or any place else in the world. You could see through the sands of the Middle East and determine uh, buried beneath the sand archaeological sites. You could look at across Europe and Asia and determine beneath the sand because of the compact dirt from many camel caravans, the old Silk Road and buried archeological treasures there. This is what we did was a proof of concept um, flight so that if, if this worked out as, as hoped or as promised that we would put the space-based radar on a satellite and have this uh, ability uh, permanently. It didn't matter if it was nighttime, you could still look down and see all these things. Cities, earthquake zones, if the earth moved just a little, it was so precise that the earth moved just a little, building up to a, a major earthquake, you could detect that movement and, uh, and then re give a cautionary note uh, that you might be expecting a large earthquake. Same way with volcanoes, uh, the, the dome in the middle of a volcano crater, it starts to swell before an eruption with a space-based radar, you could detect that change in uh, altitude of that dome and then give a warning because of it. California, you know, they get most of their water from the Sierra Mountain change, chain. And the way they determine whether they're gonna have enough water is they have someone go up and check the density of the snowpack in a few spots in the Sierras. With a space-based radar, you could fly over the Sierras at five miles a second, measure the actual amount of water in that snowpack 
and then you would know precisely whether Southern California was going to have a drought or not. It was an amazing capability. And uh, again, it, it was successful and they use space-based radars now. And this experiment right here was called measurement of air pollution from satellites. It's a carbon monoxide detector. When people, when countries sign treaties around the world saying that, hey, we won't pollute, we won't put any more carbon in the atmosphere than this amount, that treaty and that signature is worthless unless you have a way to check. Uh, this gives you ability to not only determine the quantity of carbon they put in the atmosphere, but also the source of it. So there's, there's no saying that, well, that didn't come from us. Well, you have a sensor in space that tells you exactly where it came from, exactly what it was. That was, that was my first flight. The second and third flights were to the Soviet or Russian space station Mir. And this is, this is a picture of Mir <coughs> at the time. And you can see it's a small space station. This right down at the bottom, that's the docking adapter that the space shuttle used. Space shuttle would come underneath it and then float up and then dock with a docking adapter in our payload bay. We would open the hatches and climb up through this tunnel into the crystal module and keep going through and then make a turn into the, the Russian living quarters. They had some other science mod. This is the Spectre module. I think this is Perota. This is Kabat. So they did research at Earth observations um, up while they were in space on their space station. Okay, this is, you can see, this is a Soyuz R progress dock. Here's a little solar rays on the Soyuz capsule, right, right down there. Um, the shuttle, it was designed to help us build a, a space station. And we need to know something about living on a space station and about constructing it. And one of the presidents had once said that people who reach for the stars together aren't likely to start shooting at each other, or countries that reach for the stars together aren't likely to shoot at each other. So we reached a deal with the Russians to give us some experience in long duration space flight. Remember, the shuttle was just there for a couple of weeks, max, usually less. So we had to know what it was like to live in space for months at a time and what to expect in, in building a new space station. So we signed an agreement with them that we would uh, pay them to fly American astronauts, um, train them as Russian crew members, and they would serve for long duration space flight here on the shuttle. That was a very successful program. And we learned a lot. The Russians told us that we didn't know enough about long duration space flight. It was really different than the short durations that we, that we were used to in the shuttle and they were right. Uh, so my <coughs> first mission to Mir was, this was my crew, and we went up to pick up uh, Shannon Lucid, who was one of the American astronauts that flew to Mir. She stayed up there for months, and then we went up to pick her up and bring her down and drop off John Blaha, an American Air Force colonel, um, while uh, he, you know, he trained in Russia to go in there, but he was going to ride up, not in a Soyuz, in a shuttle we would pick her up and drop off John. And we also dropped off literally tons of supplies, science experiments. This was an opportunity for us to have science experiments, again, that ran for months, not just uh, a week and a half. And we took full advantage of it. If you look around here, you can see it's pretty crowded. Behind these flags, which we put up just for the photo, there's an opening that leads back to a progress resupply uh, module. The bathroom is is on the tunnel that leads back to that progress. This is the kitchen table here. And uh, you can see the usual Velcro swabs and then straps to make sure things don't, don't float off. This is Valeri Korzun, just a, a wonderful guy. And Alexa, Alexander rather, his, uh, his partner. One of the things that would please um, you and everybody I think the most about this is that we went, you know, I was in the Marines, so the Russians weren't anybody I viewed as friends or, uh, or partners to explore with. The relationship between the astronauts and the cosmonauts was cemented with this. They studied English language. We all studied Russian language. They're just great people, and they're, they're really good at their jobs. A lot of these people we used to talk about, gosh, we wish we could get them to leave Russia and just come and join the astronaut office. They're so wonderful and so capable. 
really this program was a huge success. It was great. The second mission, same thing, tons of supplies up there. And we took um, Andy Thomas up here in the top right and took him to space, brought back Dave Wolf, who had been uh, up there for four to six months, something like that. Then we had a uh, <clears throat> couple of mere, uh, mere crewmen. There is a fantastic mission, fantastic crew, same, same thing. It was interesting. Um, you know, you can take anything. You can stand on your head for two weeks if you know there's an end to it. You just, because it, it puts a whole new attitude. The Russians, they said, you really need to pay more attention to human factors while you're up there. And it's so true that people, they came back and said, you know, I, I got lonely. In shuttle, you, you couldn't take a book. You couldn't take a movie. You, those were not allowed on the space shuttle program. Here, they, they work and then they have off time at night. They wanted to read a book. They wanted to watch a movie on a, a VHS tape or on a little uh, display device. Those things, they live there instead of just knowing that they're just there for a week and a half, like a camping trip, and then they, then they come back home. And the Russians had warned us about that. And sure enough, it was all true. When they asked, when we brought Shannon Lucy back, <coughs> the lady in the other slide, <coughs> of course, she's been up in space for months. So she's, she has difficulty walking and uh, functioning back in a gravity environment. She was climbing off the shuttle and she was hanging, hanging on hanging on to some rails and she stopped and people jumped and said, Shannon, are you okay? And she said, yes, I'm fine. I just want to stop for a second and feel the sun on my skin and feel the sea breeze through my hair. We had landed in Florida to get her off. Those things, there's none of, there's nothing like that on, on a space station for sure. And Dave, before he came back, he did a press conference and some reporter asked him, are you sorry to be leaving? And he said, he said, well, on earth, I understand you can stop at a gas station and get gourmet coffee, or you can make a phone call and 30 minutes later, someone will deliver you a pizza. None of those things are available to you in, in space. You work and then you sleep there and it's a long time. It's not like, like, well, I'll put up with this for a week and a half. You actually live there. And that's what the Russians have been trying to tell us. Personalities matter, uh, the right mindset that you're going to live here on an expedition. Uh, for a while. My last mission, <clears throat> my fourth mission, was they had started building the space station. <clears throat> they had launched a couple of modules. <clears throat> it was like launching a house, but it wasn't a home. There was no electricity yet. There was no heating, no cooling, they, uh, no gymnasium. And remember, in, in space, to stop atrophy and bone loss, you have to have exercise equipment. The modules were not talking to each other. <clears throat> How you get a side to flight is the day before they want to make the announcement, the chief of the astronaut office calls you into his office and, and, and um, he says, hey, tomorrow we'd like to announce you're the commander of, uh, of this mission, this upcoming mission. Do you agree to accept it? And of course, I don't know of anyone that ever said, no, I, I won't accept it. I said, yes, what is it? And he said, well, before you say yes, we should tell you something that, <clears throat> that the, um, the, the normal training template for a space station crew, for a shuttle crew, is a year and a half. Year, a year and a half, have a year and a half to train for your mission. The earliest, the latest you'd want to be assigned is a year, and that would be a busy schedule. And the absolute minimum ever would be, like, say, nine months on just a shuttle mission, not a station construction mission. Uh, they said, your mission is going to launch in seven and a half months. And... Um, it's, it's critical that we get it done. And I, I thought about it and I told them, I said, well, I think we can do that, but I need an all-star crew. And they said, well, you've got one. So I just wanted to introduce these crew members to you. Here's, this is Scott Altman. He was my pilot. He had flown once before. If you ever saw the movie Top Gun, he's the real person that was flying the F-14 in most of those shots. After this flight, so you do usually two flights as a pilot. And then you're assigned as commander. Well, after this flight, he did so well, which is why they gave him to me. They knew that he would, that he commanded the last two Hubble servicing missions. He had his own crews after that. Just fantastic. This guy, if you remember the movie and the story about the perfect storm, that huge low pressure area hurricane 
force winds in the, the North Atlantic trying to rescue a ship. There was a Coast Guard pilot trying to pick people out of the water. There were 100 foot swells in the ways. Uh, Dan Burbank was the real Coast Guard pilot that was flying that mission, trying to find people in the middle of that storm. He's brilliant, just a solid operator and has ice water in his veins. Rick Mastracchio, he worked in our mission control center, the shuttle mission control. He had written the books on the procedures for all the shuttle systems. He was like having Google on board. He was a Google for the, all the shuttle systems, just a tre tremendous guy. Over here on my right, screen right, is Yuri Malenchiko. Uh, we were going up to, uh, to turn these elements into a home for the first crew. Uh, those first elements were Russian equipment. It was similar equipment to what was on the Mir. Yuri had already been a commander on a six month Mir mission. So he was really familiar with this equipment because he was the commander of a mission that had used that on the Mir. And then Boris Morkov, he was a Russian flight surgeon. Uh, just a great gentleman. He's a flight surgeon. They like to have their flight surgeons have space experience. And so they flew him. And then Ed Liu, he was assigned for a long duration space flight. He had on ISS, I know, of course, no crew had been there yet. And uh, he had already trained in Russia on this Russian hardware. So he was equipped. So we, we launched in, in space. We had five dock days. They said, if you can just do these 11 things, you'll catch us up. Uh, People in headquarters were threatening to cancel the space station because it was uh, behind. So they asked us, please get these 11 things done. I'm probably the only commander that ever called to mission control. And at the morning of the third day and said, hey, uh, we know that you just, you made up this mission and stuck it between two missions. If you need us to come back early, we'll be finished today. And <clears throat> the flight director said, what do you mean? And I said, I mean, those 11 things were going to be done by noon today, space noon to us. He said, I'll get back with you. And he came back and he said, we don't want you to come back early. What else can you do? I said, just send us. We haven't trained on these other things. Just send us the list and we'll pick them out. So instead of the 11 things, we wound up doing 33 things. When we came back on time, the space station had gone from being behind to being well ahead and ready for the first crew. It was uh, these, these guys, all of them. Went on, Yuri and Ed went on flying together. Of course, these guys wound up more shuttle flights. Uh, it was, uh, they were all successful after that. This was the first crew. <coughs> uh, <coughs> Bill Shepard, a Navy SEAL, he was the commander. Yuri Gidzinko, and then, um, gosh, Valeri, no, not Valeri, it's um, Sergei Krikloff. They went on to have successful careers in the Russian space program. Really experienced guys. They're, they're wonderful. Um, this is what space station looks like now. The, uh, we have, uh, this is a little progress resupply bill, Russian resupply space vehicle. This is that base block where the kitchen table was in that one shot. And this is, uh, we call it the base block or the service module. It's really the living quarters for the crew. The bathroom is in here, the exercise equipment, the kitchen table, the kitchen itself. This next module is called the functional cargo block. And it's really just a huge storage closet for uh, all the supplies, clothes, food, et, et cetera. Then it goes in underneath this truss um, is a node and attached to that node, which is node is just a place that other segments can dock to. Attached to that node is the American lab. This is our laboratory. This is Columbus, the European laboratory. This is the Japanese laboratory they call Jim. This is the Japanese porch. They have a little robotic arm and a small airlock that they can put experiments in and then use the robotic arm to set them out and expose them to the vacuum of space. It's a great place to do materials research for outer space to determine what material can survive the radiation or the atomic oxygen trying to erode it to build future spacecraft. This is also a, a uh, module for the Japanese right there. And the airlock is, is uh, attached to the node underneath this truss. There's a little like railroad track that runs along this truss that the robotic arm can attach itself to. Then you can move the arm via this little railroad to anchor it in place to get to any place on the space station. 
These are radiators, these panels, and of course the, the big solar rays. How big is it? It's as big as a football field, has as much internal volume as a 747. Sherry and Ed, they, they wind up flying together again. And this is the space station kitchen, the table with its straps and Velcro, uh, forks, knives, and spoons, containers, Velcroed at the top and the bottom, kept in a bag. Um, here's some of the food that we borrowed some of the food from the military, the meals ready to eat. <clears throat> That's you just clip that open, you know, you put that container in an oven slot on the table then pull it out after a while the, the package is warmed up. There's, my, there's no microwave in space. There's just that oven, which will heat things up through contact with the food. <clears throat> of course, NASA, we're famous for those dehydrated pouches. This is a rehydration station over here. This is a can floating. If it's a can, it's Russian food. And uh, it's pretty good if you like Russian food. You know, it's heavy, heavy stuff, meat, potatoes, um, some other things in there, but Russian food in cans, uh, meals ready to eat, dehydrated food for us. You can't have salt and pepper because if it gets loose, it'll float into your eyes or your nose or your mouth. So all our spices are liquid and they're kept in little bottles and Velcroed around to different spots. This looks like a bottle of uh, picante sauce. When you're in space, everything seems to taste bland. So you're always trying to add uh, some kind of hot sauce to it or picante sauce to spice it up a little bit or eat it. The uh, MREs, the lasagna, the spaghetti, all the Italian dishes that were a little more spicy, they seem to, to be what everyone wants uh, in space. Also in this picture, um, behind Ed here is, you can just see inside the crew quarters, there's the sleeping bags are vertical. Of course, it doesn't matter since there's no upside down in space, you can put your sleeping bag on the wall and it doesn't make any difference to you. There's a window, you can just start to see that here at the bottom in the, the middle so the cosmonaut can look out or astronaut can look out the window <coughs> at the earth. There's a mirror in front on the wall. And then there's a place to put personal items like family photos, um, any, any other thing that you want in your personal quarters. There's a door, a pretty thick door, um, that closes over this compartment to drown out the noise. Uh, the last thing I guess would be the fan. There's a fan at the very top. You know, if you don't, since there's no gravity, even heavier gases don't sink to the bottom. So you can build up just breathing. You can build up a CO2 bubble around yourself unless you have some kind of airflow to push the CO2 away. And uh, there's a fan in the ceiling to keep that the air moving away. So you always have uh, fresh air to breathe. Anyway, this is the, the kitchen compartment and the table on the space station. <clears throat> so once station was complete, the shuttle was retired. We had no way to get to our own space station except the Russians using the Russian Soyuz capsule. This is what it looks like. This is the orbital module. This is the descent module, but it, it's also, you could say, the crude part of the model, model module. The, there's, it holds two or three people and uh, they ride to space in this compartment and they come home from space uh, in this compartment. These other two compartments, this is the uh, propulsion and instrumentation service module, the little motors that fire the Soyuz uh, once it gets in the space or in here. Once they get to space, they can unstrap from their seats. And in this uh, orbital module, there's a small galley, a small restroom facility, supplies, clothes, things like that. That, that they want to take with them. There's not much storage room in here and it's pretty crowded. The, you can see from this descent module, it's, it's 2.2 meters. So it's barely over six foot wide and barely over six foot tall. S same with these other modules, not much room compared to a shuttle. This is what a Russian Soyuz looks like on the inside, three seats. The commander sits in the middle seat, the flight engineer, sits in the uh, seat to the commander's left, and then a tourist, a guest, or a second engineer sits in the seat to the right. Typical of just like the shuttle, these are old designs with these push buttons. <coughs> this is pre-GPS, so they had a globe that they synced up and they could look at and roughly determine where they were on the planet. The, uh, so this looks roomier than it is even in that photo. 
if you put the people and the things they took to space, this is this is what it really looked like. I'm, I don't recognize this Russian commander, but this is Chris Hatfield, the Canadian that uh, uh, flew to space. And actually we were test pilots. He was an exchange test pilot while I was at Pax River. Tremendous pilot, tremendous astronaut. This is Tom Marshburn. He's a medical doctor that joined the uh, astronaut corps. And those two, uh, we flew to their trip on station aboard a Soyuz. And of course, a Russian commander in the middle. Just to show you how crowded it is, this is the, the flight engineer number two. They're all like this. You can see you have to pull your knees and your feet up in the fetal position. There's no foot room. And that's how you ride to space. And that's how you, you come home. The Russians used to go up in shirt sleeves. They didn't wear pressure suits. And, uh, and then much like we had the Challenger accident, they got back a crew that they had a vent that was open during re-entry and that vent let the air out. And then they suffered from hypoxia before they could get the vent closed. So they passed out. So it was a successful landing. And when the Russians opened the hatch, all three crew members had passed away due to a lack of oxygen. And after that, they, you know, their fix to that was to uh, ensure that crews wore pressure suits uh, during reentry. That Soyuz, by the way, is the safest, most reliable spacecraft ever made, ever. It's, it's a great thing. When it comes back, it lands on land. It's a land landing under a single parachute just prior to touchdown. It drifts under the parachute just prior to touchdown. Some rockets fire to cushion the landing a little more than just the parachute. Recovery forces come out by helicopter. They reposition if required. And then these ground forces help the crew out, get them down a slide. And then they walk them over or carry them over to a tent where the medical people are waiting to examine them and then perform any experiments on the crew members that they have agreed to prior to going. There's a lot of changes happen in your body, to your body in space. When you come back in a gravity field, your body recognizes that and starts changing back quickly. So it's important that the medical people have access to you as soon as possible. And in Russia, it's literally getting out of the capsule, getting over to the tents, and the doctors have access to you for blood draws or other uh, experiments that you've agreed to. Well, the shuttle was retired in 2011, and we were the only way to get to space was aboard a Soyuz until our commercial crew vehicles started flying. Uh, and in May, by the way, the Russians they they became pretty good capitalist in that time. The original price for a Russian seat was twenty something million dollars, and they're our only way to our only space station. And then it went to 30 something million, and then 50 million, then 75 million, then 100 million, then $105 million. They, we had no option but to argue with, that you wind up paying that money uh, anyway. <clears throat> so it was important that our commercial crew program be successful. And finally, SpaceX uh, got far enough along to launch cargo and then to start launching people. And so I think it was May of 2020. So coming up on two years ago, SpaceX finally got far enough along to uh, launch their Dragon spacecraft uh, on a Falcon 9 rocket. And gosh, it worked out well. And they had the benefit of uh, reusing this equipment and seeing, you know, during their cargo launches to make fixes as they found problems along the way before they ever got to flying real crew on board. This is actually the, the Crew-1 uh, mission or the test mission. Uh, docked to the space station and uh, the crew in there. And then SpaceX, it's not a land landing. They do like Apollo and uh, the other early programs. They land in the water. They'd like to land on the east coast of Florida. And uh, if the weather's bad there, they can land in the Gulf Coast. It was interesting on the first one, all these, these are not NASA boats. These are pleasure boats. They saw the capsule come down, came, come down so they took their boats over to uh, take a look at it while the real rescue boat is, is on its way. Once the boat gets there, it attaches uh, ropes to it, pulls it in, puts it on the ship, the crew climbs out onto the ship and then are taken back to the mainland. Elon wanted to do a land landing, but he gave that up 
convinced. He said he was convinced that NASA would never approve a land landing because it was too dangerous. And so he just went to a, a water landing. We know that Elon routinely lands um, his rockets on a barge or on landing pads. This launches the capsule uh, pretty close you know, to the edge of space, and then it returns and lands itself on this barge or on a pad or two at KSC. He's even done two at once. There are a lot of mistakes early on, but uh, it's a pretty sure thing that he'll get those rockets back now. I, I do still agree with him that he would have had a hard time ever convincing us to come back with a using propulsion to do a land landing instead of a, a shoot. The other commercial crew company is Boeing, and Boeing still hasn't flown crew. They had a test flight that um, was a failure. Fortunately, they got their capsule back, but they had some quality problems and problems with their software that prohibited a successful test flight. Uh, and again, fortunately, they got their, their capsule back. So they're fixing their problems and uh, hope to fly later, later this year, sometime in the fall or early winter. Boeing is a land landing. They come back using chutes, uh, drogue chutes, then three main parachutes, and then they uh, land. And just prior to touchdown, they inflate airbags uh, to cushion, cushion the fall or the landing. They've done that successfully twice, once in a paddleboard test, and uh, once on that, again, the failed test flight. They, like I said, they did get their capsule back. I wanted to show you guys this little space plane. They did not get a uh, crew contract uh, because their schedule didn't match our needs. Um, we did give them some money to continue developing this little space plane uh, in the hopes that we would use them for cargo later in the space station program. Now the space station was just recently extended till 2030. So there would be, if they continue to develop, there may be some launches in their form. I hope so. Uh, they fly to space on the tip of a rocket undock and come back and land like a shuttle on a runway. And that really helps getting the science off. You know, you're not waiting to get the capsule, drag the capsule onto a boat, get the crew off, then unload the science, then get the science back to a laboratory. It's just like the space shuttle. When you land on a runway or in a desert where you've got support equipment, you literally just open up, you get that science and uh, the people off to do the experiments on immediately before anything can damage it. This this would be a good deal if they do. By the way, this little space plane is made in Denver, Colorado, or near Denver, in I think you call it Louisville, Louisville, just to the northwest of Denver, and at Sierra Nevada Corporation. It's a great little thing. The last new spacecraft I'll mention is Bigelow Aerospace. <coughs> the engineers at Johnson <coughs> at Johnson Space Center developed inflatable modules, and then gave up on it. Well. A billionaire named Bigelow, who lives out in Las Vegas and has a plan out there, he liked the idea because he wanted to build a commercial space station and he would use inflatable modules. He built some and he launched them, put a camera and sensors on board, and they stayed in space. They didn't leak a drop. They, they were good and probably still are good, but he didn't have any takers. And he, he thought he was an early thinker about a commercial space station and commercial passengers paying to go. Bigelow owns, I think, Motel 6, the, all the, the entire chain. <clears throat> and he thought pay, people would eventually pay to visit a space station in space or on the moon. None of these ideas uh, caught on. And, but I want you to, to remember this, that um, because we did eventually find a use for one of his inflatable modules, and I'll show you in a minute. Um, Here's, <clears throat> well, here's, here's where it, it comes in. So here's the space station again, and here's the living quarters, then that cargo area, then it attaches to the node, and then the US lab, the Japanese lab, and the European lab. If we back up to the node that the US lab is attached to, we attach another node called node three um, to this node to give us a couple more docking spots. And we found a use for, a big low inflatable. We put that attached to node three, inflated it. <clears throat> then we closed the hatch just in case it popped or got a hole in it or leaked. 
so we didn't, wouldn't leak air out of the station. So we monitored it for a long, long time and it never leaked. So finally the astronauts and the mission controller said, hey, could we use that for storage? And they, every, they thought about it and said, well, sure, the great idea. So we inflated it. So now it's, a, it's a, got a lot of the storage. It really helps out a lot. But again, it hasn't lost any air, really. It's the, uh, I think this is a good proof of concept. And hopefully sometime in the future, uh, someone will make use of big low modules. You can imagine the benefit of flying a small compact mass uh, and then getting to space and inflating it to a large compact habitable, a large habitable volume. It's, it's a good idea. It's just uh, right now there's no takers outside of that. So <clears throat> once they canceled the shuttle, we finished building space station and we started using the space station solar. The other thing that NASA was told to do was go back to the moon and then to Mars. So we built the largest rocket ever to do that. Um, it's using these first three, there's gonna be three missions uh, to the moon and they wanted us, we were told to get to the moon by 2024. It doesn't look like that's gonna happen. It looks more like 2025 right now, but the first launch of this rocket should be within just a, a handful of months. I think they're saying April now for the first launch. If you have a chance to get to Florida and you can just Google Artemis One um, and that'll give you the current launch schedule, but it's slipped you know, from last November, December, January, February, uh, March, and now it looks like it'll probably be April before it launches. But the shuttle has six and a half million pounds of thrust. This has pretty close to 9 million pounds of thrust. They use shuttle hardware, the sod rockets, instead of three segments, they use four segments on either side that gives it extra thrust. Instead of three space shuttle main engines, they renamed them, I think RS-25, they use four of those engines now. That's where they get the extra thrust. Um, it's called the, the Space Launch System. It's the largest rocket uh, in the world right now. And the Orion capsule. They've gone back to a capsule, again, uh, not a space plane. Um, the Apollo capsule was about 12 feet This and held three people. This is about 16 feet and holds four people. So they kept about four feet. It does have about two and a half times the internal volume of the Apollo capsule. Why the moon? <coughs> because um, the biggest reason is that before we go to Mars, we need to learn how to live on a, another planet or another body in space, a hostile environment. If you have a problem on the moon, you can get in a spacecraft and you'll be back on earth in three days. If you have a problem on the way to Mars or on Mars, you're not getting back in enough time for anybody to help you. That's, uh, we need to, to shake out everything that you need to know about living on a foreign planet or space body uh, before we head for Mars. This gives us a chance to do just that. And there's a ton of science left to do on the moon. Uh, the Apollo program was canceled with three flights to go and all those examining those moon rocks. And if there's a lot of things about the moon that we don't know, one of the big things is that um, everyone thought that the moon was a dry, arid place and it's not. There's a lot of water on the moon, particularly around the South Pole. And so the the Artemis missions that return to the moon will be based around the South Pole of the moon. The last thing is that, um, you know, nuclear reactors on Earth provide a lot of clean power, carbon uh, clean power. Uh, the, uh, the problem with nuclear reactors, fission reactors, is that, of course, they produce radiation, it's radiation, and then the byproducts what do you do with the, uh, the uh, radioactive waste from a reactor? Um, the moon is covered with an isotope of helium called helium-3 that could be used in a fusion reactor is the theory. And a fusion reactor is not radioactive. It produces an incredible amount of power. And they think there's enough helium-3 on the moon to power the planet for 10,000 years. It's so valuable that a single kilogram is worth about which is 2.2 pounds, is worth about $1.4 million. Um, there's commercial companies uh, on earth right now that are interested in, in mining 
the moon for the helium three. So there's a lot of in, there's a lot of reasons to go back to the moon, but for us for exploration, it would be again to shake out what problems we might find so we can come up with fixes before we head off to Mars. So there's there's Artemis one and Artemis one is going to be a test flight and they're just going to fly around the moon and then return to Earth. And the big thing about Artemis one is to check the heat shield. The heat shield has to work and we have no way to test that heat shield on Earth. Uh, Artemis two will be have people on board and they are going to launch it on the same path. Actually, it will circle the Earth first and check out the ecosystems, you know, the, the systems you need to keep humans alive. Are you, is the oxygen system working, the air revitalization, everything that's a human system. After they circle the earth, then they will head for the moon and repeat that lap around and come back. Artemis three is the landing on the moon. It's the landing that will land the first woman and the first person of color on the moon. And uh, before Artemis three can happen <clears throat> in Apollo, you flew to the moon, you separated the, uh, the moon lander from the command module. The command module orbited the earth, I mean, orbited the moon. The lander went down, landed on the moon, they stayed there. They came back, rejoined the command module, came back to earth. Uh, <clears throat> you can't have an extended stay on the surface of the moon doing that. And plus it's prohibitively expensive. Everything that came to the moon would have to have a descent module and an ascent module and they would have to work every time. So we're gonna, they hate it when I say this, but we're gonna put a mini space station called Gateway uh, in orbit in the vicinity of the moon. Artemis three and future spacecraft will come and they will rendezvous with Gateway. Like here's the Orion on this side. It will rendezvous with Gateway. The human landing system will be attached to the Gateway. The crew will exit Orion, get into the human landing system, descend to the moon, stay for about a week, they will get to the human landing system, come back to Gateway, get back into the Orion capsule, and then they'll return to Earth. And you can look, they've got a, this is the plan one. It won't be complete by the time Artemis three happens, but some of this will have to be there. The power and propulsion element, probably some, some lab, a little bit of space, something, some type of habitation module, and of course a docking uh, place for Orion. The rest of that will, can be joined later, but you'll need a few basics to, to pull this off. So Artemis three will be rendezvousing with Gateway in the vicinity of the moon. Orion will dock with Gateway and the human landing sister system will detach, go down to the surface, bring the astronauts back up when they've done their job. They'll get back and around, then they'll return to Earth. That's the plan for uh, returning to the moon with people. And then eventually we'll have a human habitat set up on the surface of the moon that right now it, it does not have inflatable modules, but it does have a uh, pressurized rover, some little habitat, and then uh, some external things. And of course, it'll be a base that you can do EVAs and return to for longer periods of time. And all that leads us to Mars, uh, which has been uh, our target for, for really for decades now. Um, if you've wondered about, you know, we talk about the rovers on Mars. This is the, one of the original rovers, Sojourner, about the size of a wagon. Uh, Spirit and Opportunity, they said, were about the size of a golf cart. You can see that. And then Curiosity and Perseverance were about the size of a minivan. And of course, the rovers uh, grew more sophisticated as we as we learn more and as we figured out how to land and increase mass on the surface of the planet. Around Mars, uh, Spirit and Opportunity, they, you can see where they landed. We spread, we spread these around, spread these around, investigating, of course, where to land, where to search for life. Uh, <clears throat> and Curiosity landed at Gale Crater and Perseverance has landed at Jezero Crater. Gale Crater was selected um, because Curiosity's job was to determine if conditions exist on Mars that could ever support life. <clears throat> and so they landed in, it was a crater, but it also an ancient lake. And um, by the way, this hill in the middle of it, and you can see the colors go from high altitude 
to low altitude as they change to blue. So this is the deep point of all this. Uh, this hill is taller than the Grand Canyon is deep. And, but this deep section right here, uh, Curiosity examined that and it did found <coughs> what's considered the, the building blocks of life, the building blocks necessary for life. And that is it found carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And um, it looks like conditions in Mars wet pass were uh, conducive to life being formed. Hadn't, didn't find life, but it just said the conditions were right for life to have started. Now, Perseverance landed in Jezero Crater. And you can, if you look at this terrain, here's an ancient channel carved out by running water out of the rock. It leads down into this crater and forms a, a delta-shaped fan. They've used... <coughs> And they've looked at the spectrum on these minerals in this rock, and they can tell that the minerals have been changed uh, due to the water. And they found this area full of clays and carbonates. So it, this is a perfect spot, which is why it was selected to look for present life or past life on Mars. Remember, Perseverance is drilling and taking core samples that they're going to stash in a place, and then a future mission is going to bring those samples uh, back to Earth. That'll be a European contribution, the way this looks right now. Those samples will all be stashed someplace. Then in the future, they'll be put into a container. That container will be placed into an ascent vehicle. It'll launch from Mars to orbit Mars. Then an Earth return spacecraft will be orbiting Mars. It will pick up the container when the other uh, vehicle releases it. And then that will return the thing uh, back to Earth with those core samples. We'll be able to almost for sure determine whether um, life existed or exists on the, the planet Mars. This is, if, uh, it's just a self-portrait of a curiosity. That, that laboratory where the rovers were, they showed some of the trains, they did a pretty good job of mimicking the, uh, the terrain that the rovers have to transverse. By the way, curiosity is in good shape. The only problem she's having is this coating they put on her wheels. The Martian surface is so sharp and rough, it's, it's degrading that coating down to the metal pretty well, but both rovers are doing well. We used to say, and that's the reason we're going to Mars is trying to find, does life exist someplace else? We used to say, follow the water. So just a quick tour through our solar system. We had Hubble <coughs> look at one of the moons of, uh, of Jupiter, Europa and Hubble detected water geysers coming out of the South Pole. So we had Cassini, which was a spacecraft to, uh, to Jupiter, take a look at Europa. And sure enough, it's an ice crusted uh, water world underneath with a rocky core. This brown stuff, and you can tell from the lack of heavy cratering that it's in, in these cracks in the surface, it's, it's uh, active geologically. This brown stuff, we already know that's organic material, and which just means carbon base. But uh, Congress was so impressed that Congress <clears throat> ordered us to, to uh, do a mission to Europa with a lander in it. So right now there's a future plan. They're gonna use SLS, the big rocket we've made. Um, that all has to be worked out with the Artemis schedule. But, uh, and hopefully Elon's, right? You know, somebody's gotta kind of put these pieces together, but there will be a mission to Europa, there will be a lander. And ideally what everybody would like would be to land on it, drill a hole in the ice and put a big light and a camera down in that ocean and look around to see if you've got something swimming down there. But the um, uh, this icy crust is miles thick. So that has, to, that has to be worked out, but surely you can sample this organic material here and look for signs of, of life in the planet. But if you've had 4 billion years to generate life in a perfect uh, chemistry to produce it, uh, you really might find something interesting there, and which of course is why the space bus in Congress told us to do it. This is Enceladus, it's the moon of Saturn. We picked up water geysers there. This is what the surface of Enceladus looks like. Again, some craters, but not heavy cratering. You've got these cracks. So this is uh, geologically active also. Another icy world, a liquid ocean beneath the ice. Um, Mimas, another moon of Saturn. 
It's called the Death Star Moon because it looks like the Death Star from uh, Star Wars. It's an icy crust and a water world with a rocky core in the middle. If you look at the planets, you've got Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and then you've got a, a huge gap on, between Mars and Jupiter. It looks like a planet should have formed there. Well, that's where the asteroid belt is. And you have a protoplanet. It's the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. But it's referred to, I think, by most people as a protoplanet. The, the problem, the reason it didn't wind up being a, a normal sized planet is because the gravity on Jupiter was just too much to allow that to happen. But this is Ceres, the protoplanet between Mars and Jupiter. It's, it's smaller than our moon, but sure enough, it's got a thin outer crust, a water ice layer, and a rocky inner core. It's also a, a water world, and it's just a protoplanet in the middle of the asteroid belt. How much water is in here? There's more fresh water on Ceres than there is on the entire Earth. <clears throat> so water, from being thinking that Earth was the only place that there was water, water turns out to be common. I've already mentioned there's water on the moon. There's water on Pluto. There's water almost every place that we have the luxury of looking hard enough. So this increases, we used to say, you know, we have to have a water to have life. But if that's true, we've increased our probability of finding life someplace else quite a bit by discovering that there's water is a common thing, not a rare thing in our own solar system. <clears throat> Moving on to a different topic, Hubble is still, still up there, <clears throat> still making new discoveries. Um, you know, Hubble was built to be serviced. We service it with this uh, space shuttle. Once the shuttle is retired, we have no spacecraft that can rendezvous with and service Hubble now. It can't be done. A size comparison, if you've always wondered, this is where my cursor is. This is an astronaut on the end of the arm. Hubble's space telescope is a massive, uh, wonderful telescope, very large. And again, it was built to be serviced. Every time we serviced it, we replaced damage equipment, but we replaced it with better equipment. When they designed Hubble, they knew that technology would advance. So they said, well, when we replace this detector, let's use the most modern detector that engineers have produced as the years have gone by. So it kept getting better and better and better. Um, and again, uh, it's still doing just fine. Again, like I said, that uh, there's no way to service it anymore. So when something bad does happen, uh, that will be the end of it. <clears throat> What's been in the papers recently is that we launched James Webb, the replacement for the Hubble. The Hubble is a visible light and ultraviolet telescope James Webb is an infrared telescope. It's not visible light, so it won't exactly replace Hubble. It's, it looks at a different light spectrum. There's 18 of these mirrors. Each are individually adjustable, which is important. And you've got five thin heat shields right here. These heat shields are bigger than a tennis court. Gives you the, an idea for the size of the, the telescope. <clears throat> I mentioned these 18 golden mirrors and you can see that there's, when it got up there to unfold, all this stuff had to be foldable to fit inside the nose cone of a capsule. And then when it got to space, it unfolded like origami. And then they swang, swung these, uh, these wings around to lock in place with the rest of the mirrors. I'll bring this up again in a minute. That's why I pointed those out to you. So where is James Webb? Um, well, it's at a point we call L2. It's an orbit where the gravity, the combined gravity of the sun and the earth is, is matched in this location at this orbit. And James Webb will orbit around that uh, Lagrange point, uh, L2 or Lagrange 2, which it, again, there's, there's various, there's at least five of these. There's some, there's a point, I think it's L1 between the earth and the sun where the the Earth's gravity would be really close to Earth, where the Earth's gravity would match the gravity pull of the distant sun. Same one, and this is L2, which is a point in space where the combined gravity of the two is, uh, is matched in this orbit. So I mentioned those, so they've already, the first thing they had to do once they got the, the mirrors uh, in place, they pointed at a star, uh, 
260 light years away, just an average star. Each of those mirrors saw that star in a different location. 260 light years. A light year is just under a trillion miles. So it's 260 times a trillion. That's how far this star is away, it, which is a very, very long way. It's interesting that once uh, James Webb is adjusted, that star will be too bright to look at because the mirror, once it's concentrated, all these mirrors and they're all synced up, it's made to look at, at more distant things. But you can see the numbering. They're ahead of schedule. They had to find out where each of those mirrors, those 18 mirrors, thought that that star was. And some of these, and you can see that this is one of the wings, one of the wings that fell out, where the mirrors on that wing thought that it was, the mirrors on the other wing. And these other points are all individual mirrors. Uh, if you counted those, there'd be 18 of them. Again, every mirror thinks that that star is at a different location. And now they'll individually tweak those mirrors until they all uh, synchronize on a single point in the sky. And that's when James Webb will be really ready to go to work. What does it do for us? <clears throat> well, this is time after the Big Bang. So this is, this is how far back you're looking in the universe. And of course, the further things are away, the more they're redshifted. Um, in 1990, um, with ground-based observatories before Hubble went, the best you could do was about 6 billion years after the Big Bang. Uh, the Big Bang happened about 13.7 billion years ago. So you're looking back in the past over 7 billion years. 1995 with the Hubble deep field camera, you could see about one and a half billion years after the Big Bang. 2004, they replaced the deep field. Now we have the ultra deep field. They could look about 800 million years after the Big Bang. I mentioned that the further things are away, the, uh, the greater the red shifting is. So you're starting to get down into the IR, the uh, infrared region now from visible down into IR. So the Hubble ultra field, deep field IR could see 480 million years after the Big Bang. And I think, frankly, I think that's done better than that now. I think that new number is up to about 360 million years after the Big Bang. With James Webb, you'll be able to see about 200 million years uh, after the Big Bang. You should be able to see, we hope to see, the very first stars ignite and the very first galaxies uh, form. <clears throat> if you can take the formation of those galaxies and, and you compare them to uh, the modern day massive galleries, hopefully we'll be able to see how all this played out over, over this time. It's gonna be an amazing telescope. And just like the Hubble, it's heavily booked for time. All kinds of scientists want time on James Webb and want their project to, to, uh, to be one of the, you know, to get some time on the telescope. Well, it's just like Hubble. They know they're gonna find something so astounding that it's gonna interrupt that schedule. So they have booked gaps just for discovery, just, just for we're gonna find something out and this is gonna be so amazing that it'll disrupt the schedule. So let's pre-plan the excitement that's gonna come in the new discoveries. That's it for James Webb. Um, lastly, some of the other things that we study, of course, the sun. Uh, I use this picture because if you look closely, you'll see the space station and the space shuttle uh, transiting the face of the sun <clears throat> while it was in orbit. Um, the sun is our star, the life of our planet, all life on Earth depends on the sun. Unfortunately, it's so powerful that these huge corona mass ejections can do a lot of damage on Earth if they're pointed at us, which sometimes they are. They have knocked out power grids. The really big ones <coughs> can penetrate Earth's protective magnetic field, reach down to the surface and, uh, and cause havoc. And people refer to it as being thrown back to the Stone Age. If a big one hits us, it would burn all the electronic equipment. Uh, recently, maybe saw in the last couple of days in the papers that a large one went off, a coronal mass ejection pointed toward the earth it hit the atmosphere, it didn't go through it, but it heated up the atmosphere enough that the atmosphere swelled and it swelled high enough that it got some of Elon Musk's Starlink satellites, the little CubeSats that he's using to bring internet around the world. The, the new drag from the, the atmosphere, the atmospheric drag slowed the Starlink satellites up enough that they fell back into the atmosphere and burned up. He lost quite a few of them uh, 
on that. So it's a real occurrence, and we'd love to be able to predict those better than we do right now. And of course, the solar wind gives us our auroras when it hits our magnetic field, follows the magnetic field lines to the magnetic poles and creates those beautiful auroras. We're almost done, guys. Hang on to those questions. The first A in NASA stands for aeronautics. It's the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. So we do um, work on aeronautics. We're building a new supersonic plane. Um, since the Concorde was retired, there's no commercial airliner that goes supersonic. Uh, the problem is the sonic boom is so loud and explosive. You can break windows, you can break ceramic pots, you can actually knock houses off foundations if it's, if it's uh, low enough and powerful enough. It's a big problem. So you can't fly a supersonic plane over land, only in specific quarters. Uh, we think we've designed this one in a way that the, the supersonic um, blast isn't an explosive boom, it's a dull thud. So this airplane right now, this is an artist's conception. The real airplane is in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. This is it. When it arrived there, they've got the nose in another piece going through testing. But later this year, we intend to fly this. And they'll fly it over restricted ranges first to check it out. And then they're going to fly it over towns and towns around the country. And they're going to ask for feedback from the public, whether it was a nuisance, whether it did any damage, things like that. If everything works out the way we think, then you'll have with these design features, you'll be able to fly supersonic uh, uh, commercially sometime in the, in the, in the future again. We also do robots. This is Robonaut with the deputy director of engineering, the former deputy director. Uh, the robot does not, it has fingers that work well. They're not brute. They can shake your hand. They can pick up a screw and put a screw in. There's a General Motors patch on this because we did this with them. They paid for it. Um, it can pick up a barbell and hold it out and never get tired. It won't break a sweat. It can do it all day. It can pick up a screw and do fine work on an assembly line. It never takes a break, never has sick leave. It doesn't get sick, doesn't complain, shows up every day, it can work 24 hours, really. Um, and it does the fine work. It never gets carpal tunnel syndrome from doing that work. So this was an effort uh, to work with him. Our original intention was to launch it to the moon when we thought we'd be getting to the moon a lot sooner than we did now. And what we hoped it would do was when it first walked, it has legs, when it walked off the landing craft onto the surface, they said, look at the camera and say, I see you back, back to earth. It has, it's electrically powered with its power station. It can plug itself in and then it can unplug, walk around, explore, do whatever we would want a, a humanoid to do. As its battery gets slow, it goes back and powers itself, plugs itself back in. And power. That's the thought. We'll see as we get further in our lunar program whether this is revived. And of course, we study the planet. Uh, with our partner agencies like NOAA, uh, everything about uh, the climate, the planet, the water cycle, the climates, everything about the planet NASA is involved with. And guys, here's a picture of our country. Here I am in Houston. Stallis, and here you are up here in Denver. You can pick out your own spots, Los Angeles, San Diego, San Francisco, Orlando, New York, Chicago, Cleveland. Uh, it's a beautiful place, but one worth taking care of. And that's everything I've got. Sorry for the length, but I can certainly take your questions now, as long as uh, you guys are, are able to stay on. Okay, thank you so much, Terrence.